Hello everyone, today we talk about medieval Genoa, a maritime republic from the 11th century, roughly, but we will see also here what were the previous predispositions, conditions that are not dramatically documented for, you know, th these uh, realities in, uh, in early medieval Europe, but that we understand ever more having had a direct continuity, essentially, with with Roman times, especially in the urban and Mediterranean dimension of these important centers, trade centers, that um, by pursuing a independent policy fundamentally rose to be these um, incredible uh, commercial powers uh, in medieval civilization, basically the most important ones, right? By, by simply by scale of traffics and accumulated wealth and also, in fact, the continuity of this, even in moments of, of decline, uh, perceived, you know, stereographically decline, but, you know, the, the before these powers effectively lost their own uh, market powers, it took centuries and centuries, even after the opening of the Atlantic routes and so on, these became bankers of the Spanish Empire later on. Today we stop to essentially the first loans in fact to Charles V and we can't go in detail fully on all the um, all the details of Genoese history which is very very complex and uh, this is uh, yet another uh, video on, on, on requests right so for which I you know, I, I want to make a, a general synthesis as for this uh, let's say manualistic topics that I, I choose now on a kind of a territorial base and it's important to stress in fact in this no, for no, no, this northwestern Italian city-state how uh, in fact different in, in, um, in nature from, from other powers technically the, 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 the maritime republics in practice were right we made lots of videos about the Italian communes altogether we didn't we did talk objectively about the, the the Italian maritime republics, mostly about Venice and Genoa that naturally were the most important and um, that uh, appear prominently also as you know in Byzantine history as we've seen uh, with the substitution fundamentally to the Imperial Navy and the, the, the broader um, uh, rivalry between the two city-states, how they, they intertwined with uh, the reconquest of Constantinople, how the Fourth Crusade, how they lived long after, or even after the Ottoman intervention. We have partially, we made some video about the Italian maritime republics per se, right, but mostly framed them into this broader communal phenomenon that I realized the more I make these videos, and the least it is actually um, uh, interiorized properly in, in Western popular culture, which is kind of strange. Like this, this centers mostly in in imaginary uh, figure as sort of you know trade towns of some you know importance, but a very few uh, understand not just the, the 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 enormous structured you know state state building and properly wealth accumulation in this in this this cities right so always remember this these were not towns right especially in in, in, in Italy the permanence of the civitas as we were saying before from 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 Roman times is something that goes far beyond it, it it's properly a city it's not a town right um, and it is a such a state right but also the international way right and the relative you know lack of interest properly that these cities had in building a territorial domination that is to say and we were discussing it incidentally the other day also for for other um, medieval realities that finding something like empire properly is, um, is 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 very rare by medieval standards so that when we look also at the uh, the dominions of these republics with we look at it and say, oh, well, this looks like an empire. After all, they had colonies, right? They had... Well, this is not really true, right? The, there was surely some exploitation of local resources, etc., but the aim was fundamentally uh, caching from the point of uh, passage, right? Properly from the from the market, from the trade center, holding those, right? Often as with this fundux of property quarters, which is an Arab term, quarters within 
within the same city, very often the ones connected with, with eventually with the port facilities. And um, but as we were saying, uh, as I was uh, saying properly, the international weight that these centers had, the fact that these were the single most powerful naval realities in medieval medieval Europe, uh, and broadly speaking, in medieval history, in as much as we we understand that the uh, existence of permanent fleets in this time was not a thing right major powers with uh, maritime interests mostly were uh, interested first of all in maintaining trade flowing and that's one of the reasons why also the Italians after having swept the, the Mediterranean of Saracen uh, piracy uh, were the ones who made this thing flow and traded fundamentally with everybody Right, even against papal decrees, uh, you know, with the Muslims selling weapons, slaves, things like these, um, but that properly were uh, these greater powers wouldn't have the need to maintain a fleet, right? Because something atrociously uh, costly, right? And they would essentially create it every once in a while, right? For very specific. Uh, objectives essentially having either to supply the troops along the coast we made we explained this for example in the video about Byzantine tactics that in you know deals also with part of strategy because that's what medieval navies con concretely were also ancient ones we were not in more modern times where you know uh, fleets go back and forth they can't cover all the you know the the, the sea space that they, they can't you know, properly fight as, uh, against each other, scoring in this sense dramatic strategical um, results by blocking other parts, whatever. No. Uh, mostly uh, fleets were used to block aid uh, coastal centers from the sea, because without that you couldn't basically storm them, right? And uh, this is also very interesting, because considering that the, uh, the Italians were in, in control of the sea, in this regard, there was no way, uh, very often, their own possessions, as we were saying before, could be properly out, you know, taken out, right? It could be a ferocious land struggle, but most of the times, right, if these were quite determined to resist, there weren't properly the, the means to, to dislodge them. And that's why they stayed literally for that long, right? The Italian presence in the Near East, we, we made a bit about the Ultramar fleets, the Italians of the Crusades, um, and that explains a bit how the things uh, worked, but consistently the Italians were in the East before the Crusades, during the Crusades, and after the Crusades, and also most of the Crusades could have not been carried out realistically uh, without these uh, maritime powers, not just because they consistently ship uh, crusading armies uh, from Europe to the Near East, and uh, you know that there were also land routes. But if they, the, the, you know, the Crusader states had had to maintain their own possessions, without the constant supply from Europe, that was carried out essentially by the Italians as a medium, there would have been basically no way to, you know, last strategically. That you know, uh, the Near Eastern Crusades, the Crusader states wouldn't last dramatically long. But surely they would have not properly hold, and some of the major conquests, as we'll see now, such as you know the siege of Antioch, could one of Jerusalem, were literally impossible without without Italian. Uh, Godfrey of Bouillon wrote on the Holy Sepulcher, "This is you know the most strong Genoese bulwark." Right, eventually was because, as you know, Jerusalem was stormed with siege towers were built by Genoese engineers having, after having dismantled their galleys. Right, so again. Without the sea blockades, without the dramatic um, naval engineering, logistical, technical capacity of, of the Italian maritime republics, also the, their military, by the way, um, crusades as we know them in the Near East would have fundamentally not existed. And this is the crucial aspect of it, understanding the enormous dimension, like if you look at the the sheer amount of resources burnt by, for example, the uh, Venetian Genoese wars with these uh, attack against convoys that were at the end of the day convoys against convoys at some at some level, um, and where if you look, in, you know, if you picture it in terms of how the war expenditures Europe wide, right, meaning all the European countries put to get the 
I, I don't know, I don't have the figures here, but I read at some point, it was as if, you know, the Italians burned at that point, fighting against each other, and, and that was still worth, because it tells you how much worth the Inca for for controlling the, those routes. And in or like, um, I don't know, we're talking about several kingdoms at a time. It, 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 it was utterly incredible and the reason why it's tricky to overlook this reality is because as we were saying they were not interested in territorial expansion so people equate no territorial expansion equates no power right this is actually wrong right um there is properly uh an interest to essentially be that community making an astonishing amount of money and using that for political military purpose essentially to protect the city that in fact were basically and uh like for political reasons they, they would accept signories whatever venice could not fundamentally ever be stormed uh the genoese were the only ones who went close to it because they had the fleet but otherwise were no, no way out and all the 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 essentially the the the, the enormous uh, civilizational cultural center you know development that derived from this maritime city that is to say you know if you take venice out of the Renaissance equation, you have a completely different Europe. Um, the same goes for properly all the nautical, uh, cartographical. Think about the age of exploration. As we were saying before, essentially, if you look at you know the main uh, fleets in Western Western monarchies, etc. If you look at the French, the Spanish, you know, th th those were effectively basically all Genoese fleets, right? It took like it's just at the very end of the of the, of the Middle Ages, they they started building like a national fleet. Right, gradually, right, but ships, admirals, crews, armaments, these were provided, were lent, right, uh, by the uh, the Italian maritime republics and fundament for, for, even there, for, 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 for money, right, and for increasing further that dependency of these same powers on this maritime, uh, and that, that is obviously the, the obviously the examples in as we were saying before in, in in the Byzantine Empire that gradually by the 12th century fundamentally hands over the their maritime capacities to the Venetians and uh, the same reconquest and maintenance let's say a part of the Paleologo Empire at the end of the Middle Ages is fundamentally because of the, the presence of the Genoese fleet that uh, colonized this is where as we were saying maintaining coastal dominations, right? Even if you see entire islands, like for, for the Venetians, I don't know, Crete, or later Cyprus, that was first Genoese, then Venetian, etc. Uh, or, you know, other centers we'll see now. But these were still about their ports, right? And their cities, their this important structural, important infrastructural faci trade facilities, but also properly fortresses. I mean, if you look at Greece, uh, some of the a great part of you know late medieval fortifications; those are all fundamentally Italian ones. And again, it's difficult to properly explain how uh, it's complex. It's not difficult to explain how the development took place. Also, because it, it should be contextualized within the Italian reality, right? Not all Italian maritime republics were alike, right? We will see it with Genoa today. Um, but they kind of shared in part uh, the um, you know the, the the involvement within the Italian mainland. That is another reality that is dramatically overlooked, not studied. There is basically the, I'm the first person who's making for us for many other medieval topics on, on YouTube, like literally that makes video about this. There are billions of videos out here, and it's disgusting that in 2021 uh, Western culture has produced zero about basically some of the single most important elements of its own culture and civilization. And um, it ger generally reflects the properly, not just the historical ignorance of you know, the, the, the mass in, in, in our world, but properly the, this very serious lack of not it's not much an intellectual thing properly of cultural um uh, tools of education concretely meant right properly what you learn about the world you live in and the hierarchy the perspective and the importance you, you are able to, to to give to certain realities i think this premise is, is particularly important why venice in genoa i will see well because they were some of the most uh, were the most important they were the most sheltered 
in a sense, right? They they were the ones that also for geographical reasons, the lagoons from one side, the Apennines, and the Alps from from the other were fundamentally, mm, you know, sheltering the centers. Some of the earlier, uh, some of other maritime republics were were not like this. some were like this, like Amalfi, for example, in the south. But the Norman kingdom centralized and kind of choked its development. Uh, or Pisa it was instead open in, in its countryside, also in land power. Um, but there are other centers, also Ragusa had an important, uh, you know, uh, important location. Uh, there are cities like Ancona. There are actually more maritime republics than the canonic four that are normally uh, remembered. So uh, I want to thank, of, of course, uh, all of the people who are um, advising me uh, topics for this, and I'm uh, telling you that really there is really a lot to cover if one looks in detail and carefully about this. So if we have to give a bit of background arriving to the to the 11th century. So uh, Genoa was essentially part of the Italic Kingdom. Uh, it was a Roman city uh, during the the migration year. Eventually, was uh, was controlled by first by the Byzantines that had remained in control, especially of the coastal areas. Was conquered by the Longobards in 643. Um, we're not excessively documented about these realities. We we don't uh, like between the 9th to 10th century. The, there is some foggy in part because they are not being researched adequately, properly, but also properly because of the lack of a. Uh, well, functional, for example, centralized state. At this point, we're in post carolingian times. The Italic Kingdom, like all the others, except basically the Western Frankish in extremis, managed, uh, you know, managed to, to, to form anything centralized. And in Italy, the more, that because of these cities, of these impressive, um, you know, infrastructural, uh, damic, commercial, literate, uh, advanced presence in you know, in, in great numbers, right? They're the ones that emerged here from the commune of Genoa was a commune, right? We're, we're explaining briefly what that means. Um, we're like 30 at a time. You know that fundamentally they would take over the de facto control of this, this area and the, and the fact that the kingdom was never factually conquered by, by anybody for, 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 for all the rest of the Middle Ages um, uh, allowed these centers differently from the South, for example, that urbanistically speaking was even better, you know, in geographically better exposed to, you know, for, for trade. And that's what, you know, Southern cities like Amalfi rose before the others, right? But it was choked by the, the Normans instead of established, instead of what, what was paradoxically the most centralized kingdom in Latin Germanic Europe. Um, so the city passed through these uh, difficult times, especially during the Saracen activity. We made videos about the Saracen era and all the implications that are sometimes, even in there, very often misunderstood, mostly in an ideological sense, because the story goes that you know the Saracens passed and destroyed everything. Genoa knows better because it was actually destroyed. <laughs> Um, by by one of their raids, but at the same time you realize that if it was there the the, the following century together with Pisa to literally sweep the whole Western Mediterranean and beyond of Saracen fleet, and that you know the Fatimids had directly targeted it and, and raised it, you know for for some it it wasn't just a, a town as we we're saying before it was already something else, and in fact what the Italian maritime republics show since the 11th century is. Uh, something atrociously advanced for having blossomed fundamentally just by the end of, of the Saracen era, uh, like you know, as if this, by the way, had stopped by chance, right? It was actually the tides had turned, and these realities were already uh, dramatically advanced for early medieval standards. It's just we haven't studied them enough and understood properly what what they already were. It would be a lot to talk about this. Also about the coordinational capacities of the cities, their in intertwined interests. You will see Genoa and Pisa will were kind of carrying out as allies some certain same strategic objectives of fighting each other in the, in the same time, right? And that's that's counterintuitive, but it's it's real. And um, uh, so uh, Genoa emerges as uh, this uh, commune consisting of uh, the so-called compagne. The compagnia, which means literally with uh, people that share the same bread, right? In in terms of a uh, you know oath, 
you know, say your sworn uh, associations, like bit like guilds, right? Corporations that people say they're trade associations. Yes, technically it is true, especially for cities like Genoa, but conceptually there's something greater, right? The fact that especially in the uh, maritime cities, this would develop effectively for naval, uh, for shipbuilding, trade, um, you know, insurance companies and so on. And this would rise effectively as the largest by the 16th century after the failure of the Fokker, uh, the, the the largest banking system in Europe, right? So um, this this tells you what they, they factually were about, so much that in that case Genoa becomes the bank of St. George, that was technically the bank. So the city, was, it's not that the city was a bank, it's the bank was the city. And, and that also is uh, is an exception, right? You understand that these were exceptional realities, you know, where or not. And um, the communal government here, we, we can't explain fundamentally the, 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 these were republics, as they're called, there were councils, different corporations, etc., and some degree of central institutions that regulated publicly the, the system. The Genoese it's from, from the, the 14th century have a fixed Dodgy like the, uh, which comes from Dux, from Duke, uh, fundamentally like the Venetian one. But compared to, uh, it's in fact, its um, uh, Lagunar counterpart, uh, it, it wasn't as, uh, s you know, c centralized properly and in in politically and in institutionally uh, satellites and stabilized like Venice, right? And this on the long run, even in, in the war against the same rival, would bring to um, to the Venetian prevalence, right? And Genoa has this characteristic that rather being ruled from a common council where, you know, uh, surely private interests of all these various patrician families that invest in sea trade and, you know, mostly went for privately, but in, in this sense, they represented the commune by itself and therefore were able to, to, to maintain a, a direction and also, a, you know, with an elite, uh, but also with, leaving space to the middle classes. In Genoa, um, the city was effectively ruled in uh, largely in a private way. That is to say, these various clans, these various patrician families, were a bit always um, divided and wouldn't create something so stable and functionalized, governmentally speaking, as Venice. Right? This doesn't mean that they weren't, you know, still impressively developed, but they... Um, there are many considerations also connected, for example, to the fact that Genoa had effectively an interland, right? Venice didn't, because it was on, on, the, lagoon, on the islands, on, in the lagoon. While when we speak of Genoa, we're actually looking at the Ligurian coast, the Ligurian interland, that yes, it's not something dramatically, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just mountains practically, right? But still, uh, it's it's a fairly extended, and therefore there were many possessions, many castles, etc. And all these families would, from once they were overthrown from from the city, they would always entrench in their fortifications in, in the countryside, and then they, they they would harass the city, and therefore Genoa was more permeable, definitely, than than Venice, and in this sense probably also more exposed to instability in the first place, also for, from external powers. Right, besieging a city like Genoa was was enormous enterprise as well. Um, so this uh, mostly political matters were settled either either by accepting, negotiating a foreign seigniory that would, however, still you know largely cooperate with the local commune, um, and basically not much else because again uh, the, the 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 city itself also it's uh, it, the the control of the sea effectively because in the Western Mediterranean, nobody could challenge that, and the Venetians never went as far as besieging Venice as the Genoese actually did against them. Uh, surely it was um, a safe conduct, let's say, for the, uh, let's say for the survival of, of the city. Um, Genoa also had, to just make you understand the, the mentality, the background, had this nickname of the, the superb. Right, that was was in reference. It was coined by Petrarch, but it was already there properly as a title. Right, the uh, the dominant one, the dominant of the seas. Right, the, the Republic of the Magnificence because of its glory, its impressive landmarks. Right, also properly the military glories because, as we were saying bec before, basically all the majority of all the greatest 
admirals in medieval history were either you know Venetian Genoese and the Genoese properly had also more involvement worldwide in the sense in the sense that the service of other powers that proved uh, of dramatic importance also for its their political connections. So technically, as we're seeing, and differently from Venice, that was ideally still within the Byzantine Empire and therefore eventually growing as a, an independent thing on its own, Genoa was part of the Holy Roman Empire, right? So nominally, uh, the Holy Roman Empire was overlord and the Bishop of Genoa the president of the city. However, as it happened, basically in all Italian city-states, the, uh, the, the consular government, we made videos about this within... The, the communal you know institutions where popular assemblies were de facto the uh, the rulers right there were uh, collegial magistrature like naturally reminiscence of, of the Roman one but you know it was it was functional in a sense and um, as we've seen before uh, uh, Genoa had uh, suffered, say, the, the coastal attacks of the Fatimid navy. Uh, the Muslims had raided also Pisa in 1004 and 1015. So they they went f forward by raiding Luni, uh, close to, to La Spezia. Um, and uh, these th um, attacks would be being carried out both from Africa, actually from Spain, Right, the Taifa of Denia, for example, attacked Sardinia. It was already, you know, an area where the Genoese and the peasants were interested in. Mostly, you know, that they would split. They, they would, these were also ferocious rivals at the beginning uh, of our period, before the Genoese knocked them out in 1284 with the Battle of Melori. Uh, but the the sphere of influence was normally, um, at, at least as far as the, the main Tyrrhenian islands, Corsica for the Genoese and Sardinia for the peasants. Albeit the main targets as we were saying before were controlling the the ports of the eastern Mediterranean uh, directly, um, and uh, and the Pisan and, and Genoese fleets were heavily involved. In fact, in defense of Sardinia, in defense of of course of their own cities, and at the same time, however, in also fighting against each other. In fact, in 1066, Genoa and Pisa. Uh, began to fight each other, possibly over the control of Sardinia. That was, uh, as you know, was politically divided, but much of a, uh, you know, you know, with, 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 with a wild interland, but still important resources, uh, such as precious metals, etc. So, these more advanced kind of Francicized powers were, you know, provided even with, you know, heavy cavalry, crossbows, and early, and early also technical, as we were saying before, logistical development, important resources effectively colonized the coast, exploiting local labor force, and in fact there are many vestiges of, of, of medieval uh, Italians in, in, in Corsica and Sardinia as they, uh, they they were colonizing them from towers mostly and this, this broader net of connections of control of the, of the islands and spotting enemy fleets, things like these. There were other competitors, naturally, uh, uh, we were saying before where other uh, maritime republics, especially from the south, had emerged from essentially independent uh, Byzantine duchies such as the ones of Amalfi, of Gaeta, etc. But in the Tyrrhenian Sea, effectively, Genoa and Pisa were emerging as the leading powers and quickly, you know, overshadowing the others. Uh, but it wouldn't have the, the strength, the necessary strength to knock each other out for a while, right? And this would happen also. You know, gradually, without the actual, this is important to stress, without the actual conquest of one another, right? But just you know, the the actual mm, affirmation of one superiority and actually the other, as would would happen uh, to follow the greater one. When the peasants were defeated by the Genoese, as good merchants, they understood that that was the new flourishing market and invested in it. Right? They still made their own money and still had their own power in the meanwhile. By the way, important also to arrest the one. So. Um, there is this background to consider to today we can't just do it but it's important to remember it now in 1087 the Genoese and the Pisan fleets led by Hugh of Pisa and supported by the uh, by Amalfi Salerno Gaeta and, 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 and the Papacy attacked the North African Tunisian 
city of Madia, the capital uh, of the Tunisian uh, Fatimids. They, they, they attack, um, supported uh, by Pope Victor III, acquired a specific character that has been uh, essentially mm, paralleled to to a real crusade. There was some indulgences, contem indulgence contemplated for the participation. It was control, you know, done in the name of God, like actually any expedition of the time, right? The Crusades, in this sense, didn't quite invent anything. It was just essentially the the authority was waging them that had changed, uh, and it was a success because fundamentally the uh, the Italians managed to destroy the Arab fleet in the harbor. Uh, they wouldn't hold the city. Uh, and and, and they, they would withdraw, but the destruction of the fleet was enough strategically to ensure the control of the Western Mediterranean to Genoa. Uh, Venice also intervened partially in the West at this point. It's uh, in Western Mediterranean, the, but you know, it's soon understood that it was not really their waters and peace, as we're saying before. And this. Uh, this the, the the Madia campaign was and, and the Christian success was of great importance for enabling properly from a from a strategical and logistical point of view the first crusade itself, which was waged, uh, you know, a, a decade later uh, by sea, right? And if this had been out of control, if it had been tried, it would have been much more complicated to organize the expedition. In 1092, Genoa and Pisa cooperated with the Iberian monarchs to, um, to essentially, in their fort of Reconquista, alongside the, 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 the Mediterranean Iberian coast. In fact, they attacked the Muslim uh, Taifa of Valencia to, uh, in cooperation with land forces of Alfonso VI of Leon and Castile. And also, they took Tortosa with the support from uh, from Sancho Ramirez, King of Aragon. Uh, these are also overlooked scenarios, but uh, these uh, city, this, this coastal cities were, you know, effectively stormed thanks to the naval support that, as we have seen, was necessary most of the times to carry out such uh, such sieges, blockades, etc. Genoa started expanding uh, on the wake also of the of the crusading success, right? The Crusades. So, as you know, the creation of these powers, mostly on the uh, Syrian, Lebanese, Palestinian coast, that were effectively the areas where the Silk Road ended, and therefore their coastal centers were the areas from which now, in Christian hands, the Christians could access. And as we've seen, the First Crusade also was waged, in, uh, we'll see it better now, in cooperation with the, the, the Genoese, the peasants, etc. And as the virtually the only Christian power capable of providing th that amount of ships, because we haven't stressed this, now I'll explain it better, to profit, to occupy this uh, market uh, squares and entrench into the you know to the port facilities and fortifications, and making money over and over. And and the the truth being that actually the Italians were already partly there. Venetian presence in Egypt and Egyptian is very, very old. Like it dates, at least I think the first evidence for it is in the ninth century. But surely there was something already uh, going on, right, from from other centers and so on. It would continue on even against, you know, crusading. Let's say the the overall overall very vaguely in the sense Christian interest, right, etc. But they would sell weaponry and you know uh, slaves from the the coal. Uh, Venice mostly raiding from the Slavic coast, and so on and so on. Um, and in uh, this this aspect of the fleet of the uh, galleys availability is crucial. For 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 the simple reason, I was asked recently. I didn't answer that question, but I could make a question and answer video about to to clarify it. But the concept being that why were these powers so navally? Uh, you know, superior in by scale to any other mm, power at that point. Well, the point being this: that they they effectively didn't have anything like a truly permanent fleet. That is to say, there was not like uh, 
a certain amount of galleys that was controlled just by the commune and maintained just for the sake of eventuality. But they wouldn't need that. Why? Because all these, uh, the, the noble houses of the city would arm galleys on their own. Right, and not just they were inter they were effectively the guys who led who who led the, the communal policy, but were the ones that in case of danger they could provide their own galleys to defend the city. And we're talking about fleets of tens, right, of tens of galleys of at some point later on also hundreds of galleys. So something properly uh, to be put together that that had concretely been and and these galleys were always available. Right, especially in times of emergency where you couldn't really, you know, sail without, uh, you know, problem. Uh, but around and there you had to defend and make mass. But it's as if this made virtually this powers having de facto, actually, uh, a permanent fleet antiliterum all the time. So that's what they had. Why they had so many galleys to land to serve as well, because they were effectively the first of all the only ones who had them, and secondly, they had a lot of them. Right, and that's where they were they were sold so much. And this doesn't even stop to the galleys, by the way. But as we were saying before, to the broader technical skills and even for certain amount of troops that were, as you know, quite especially in the case of Genoa, uh we'll have to make a video about their crossbowmen and it's not even that simple, like the Genoese were just the best crossbowmen ever. But sure, yeah, they, they went close to it in terms of you have to understand why they were, first of all. But let's say that that was a standard could find also in other... The peasants also had pretty good ones, for example. And also used it, uh, on land, on pitch battles, which the Genoese basically didn't wouldn't venture any. I can't think. There was basically never a, such a thing like a Genoese pitch battle, because simply they wouldn't go out for it from their mountains, and their city would always operate that. The peasants did, for example. Uh, the Venetians were just supplied because at some point to, to expand on land to counter the Milanese attacks. But Genoa was just a very, you know, properly now an exquisitely naval power in that regard. Yes, there were Genoese troops, I don't know, in the Hundred Years' War, look at Carsi, uh, Poitiers, all these things. But they were, they were serving in other powers. They were individual units of mercenaries and other things. But Genoa retained a control on them, meaning that they, uh, the, Gen the Genoese crossbowmen were a bit like the Swiss uh, pikemen later on. That is to say, their governments told them that they couldn't go out there without permission, being hired as mercenaries. Right? For Genoa, it was always like this. Actually, the Swiss at some point failed because they said, you know, screw your government. <laughs> I hope, you know, make a living somewhere else. But that was also, as you understand, a, a land power, a completely different reality. And anyhow. And, and not a mono power, like there were different cantons. The city of Genoa was the city of Genoa, in spite of the various nobility or the separations, but still within the city, within the state, right, as such. So in 1097, Hugh of uh, Chateauneuf, Bishop of Grenoble, and William, Bishop of Orange, went to Genoa, preaching in the church of San Siro, in order to gather troops for the First Crusade. Uh, at the time, Genoa was uh, like maybe not such a huge city by compared to others were already expelled, like Milan, etc. But we can't imagine when we range of tens of thousands, maybe ten thousand, right? And maybe something more. Um, twelve galleys, one ship, and twelve hundred soldiers from Genoa joined the crusade, which makes you understand like these are numbers in you know, eleventh century sources or somewhat late, but it, it tells you the degree of militarization of these centers, which is often overlooked. Always remember this, that Italian communes were born, historiography has at this point completely, you know, demonstrated it primarily, like the, 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 the first object was the army, was the exercitus, was the idea that every citizen had the duty and the privilege to be part of the communal army as, in theory, as a noble. You see, back in the day, this was this idea, also from the Germanic background, from these countries had their own law, um, that the, the, a bit also like the Romans did in, at the beginning, you know, the, the idea that the, the freeman is, is technically a nobleman, that is, nobility in theory in the tribe doesn't quite exist. They are all, like, valid because they are, as long as they're freemen, right? So they have this prerogatives, this duty. So in this kind of very, you know, 
egalitarian realities for feudal standards uh, that exist in Europe, uh, the uh, popular participation to the army was something remarkable. And as we're seeing, we're seeing now, they were qual quality, quality troops, right? This is also another thing is overlooked, but saying, ah, you know, when the Italian communal militias were, hmm, you know, like a second grade thing, right? You know, not like feudal countries with knights, but were actually the same thing. Um, th there is no difference. It's just, you know, from one side you have castles and countryside, from the other side you have city uh, walls and, you know, urban communities. But the typology of soldiers would be exactly the same, and actually these centers would be also the, the most, as we've seen, technically advanced, because they were also the most, w the, the wealthiest per capita, a per capita in the, in the organization of their own armies at the same time, right? The reason why I didn't explain before, you know, why those noble houses could maintain galleys, right, and maybe entire states didn't, is that those, those houses were incredibly wealthy individually, right, and the fact that they maintained a galley is the, the same explanation why they were, because through those galleys, through trade and piracy, um, they would make the amount of money that was sufficient, not just to maintain the galley, the, all the facilities, etc., and expanding for them, upkeeping, etc., the crews, um, supplies, etc., but to make further and extra money, right? That is exemplified by the, you know, also by the the urban civilization of the times, eventually the Renaissance, etc., to properly the material wealth of these centers that wouldn't die out even up to the 17th century. Basically, it's just at that point that um, countries like the Netherlands, uh, England, surpass in terms of uh, of absolute, not even relative wealth, uh, the, the Italian states. Right now. Um, so as we've seen, the Genoese take part of the crusade, the first crusade. The, the Genoese troops were commanded by the noblemen de insula and the avocado, these were different families, they set sail in July 1097. And the Genoese fleet transported, as we've seen, and provided naval support to the crusaders, mainly during the, the most important op operations of the first crusade were the siege of Antioch in 1098, when the Genoese fleet blockaded the city with the troops provided, suppo um, providing support during the, the siege as well, and the siege of Jerusalem in 1099, right? Genoese crossbowmen led by Guglielmo Imbriaco acted as support units against the defenders of the city. Also, after the capture of Antioch on May the 3rd, 1098, the Genoese allied with uh, Bohemond of Tarent, who became the ruler of the uh, Principality of Antioch, in fact, it was, you know, after the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the most important Crusader states, Bohemond was an Hauteville, right, so he was part of the royal family of the Siculo Norman Kingdom, and this meant a lot also in Italian politics, so much that, as we're, as we're saying before, while the Normans also were provided with the, you know, the, the ship, the, the, the port facilities, etc., of the uh, southern uh, Italian coastal centers, and they would have kind of a fleet on their own, but factually, they would be ever more dependent on mostly Genoese, um, Genoese forces, given that, you know, the Venetians mostly swamped, you know, even in there, it was a very complicated policy, but, you know, the... Uh, the, the, the Venetians were pro-Byzantine, right, largely, and they didn't like whoever could choke the strait between uh, uh, Italy and the Balkans. So, generally speaking, they, they would be anti whoever was in southern Italy as a consequence. And Genoa would act accordingly from the other side to counter them. And um, Bohemond granted the Genoese uh, headquarters the, ch uh, the Church of St. John and 30 houses in Antioch. And on May the 6th, 1098, a part of the Genoese army returned to uh, the mother city with the relics of St. John Baptist granted to the Republic as part of their reward for having provided military support to, to the Crusades in the, in the Near East. Uh, as a consequence, many settlements in the Near East were given to Genoa, as well as 
favorable commercial treaties. The Crusader uh, monarchs were, you know, quite uh, eager to secure their um, supply routes with Europe, as we've seen, and entrusting the, uh, you know, this this uh, service to, you know, to 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 the main to, to the major uh, fleets uh, available, right, and properly having, in turn, the the interest, as we've seen, to profit from these markets. In fact, Genoa allied also with King Baldwin the uh, first of Jerusalem in the beginning of the 12th century in order to secure the alliance. Baldwin gave Genoa one third of the lordship of Arsuf, one third of Caesarea, and one third of Acre, and its ports income. This was the practice; like a portion of the city was given to them. Right? That we'll see also, you know, in 1204. Uh, with the Venetians, famously enough, they received, I don't remember how much, one, one third, one fourth, I think, of, of the Latin Empire. They said, no thanks, we don't, you know, we don't want the, uh, to, to engulf ourselves in the feudal mess that you, you have created in the continent. We just want the ports. And they were very clever doing that. Well, the same that they would do the Genoese with the Palio, as we were saying before. Um, also, the Republic of Genoa would uh, receive 300 bezants every year and one-third of um, the king of Jerusalem conquest every time uh, uh, 50 or more Genoese soldiers joined his troops. Which speaks of the, the quality or the perceived quality of, of Genoese troops that surely at the time had, as we've seen, uh, already were quite useful for their mostly for their engineering capacity, but probably had de were developing some kind. Of, this would be famous, especially in the Third Crusade with the Italian crossbow and the Battle of Arsuf with uh, Richard Lionheart that fenced off the Turkish Turkish cavalry and um, used in in this fashion to you know uh, with their uh, in, in cooperation with with heavy cavalry, right? And uh, the Republic's role as a maritime power in the region secured many favorable commercial treaties for the Genoese merchants. Um, it is important to stress, as we will see better now, that these merchants were not like technically uh, officials of the city. They were acting privately. Right, the go the communal government, like, like in Venice, it's easy to see that. The, the communal government says, well, do whatever you want. Uh, out there, carve your own lordships with the means that you f deem, you know, more appropriate. Uh, but always remember that you are effectively citizens of the Republic. So you have your houses here. You have effectively nowhere else to, to literally go. Or at least, you know, in this new land, maybe some, some made really a great fortune, some uh, quite important principalities. But still, it was much profitable to be a, uh, a citizen of those Republics because as we've seen, the wealth concentrated there by far... Uh, outshed at any other, right? Um, and uh, as a consequence, it would be always a, a political unity, a political cohesion, right? There would be a, an agreement for which, you know, they, they would subcontract certain expeditions and, uh, you know, require the, 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 the mother city would require a, a portion essentially of the incomes carved from, from these lordships. And um, as a consequence, Genoa came to control a large portion of the trade of the Byzantine Empire because there were not just uh, the Venetians exclusively there. Actually, the same emperors would uh, counter a Venetian presence at times to, you know, flirting with the Genoese and so on. Uh, Tripoli in Libya, the Principality of Antioch, as we have seen, Cilicia and Armenia, right in the in the northwest of the same principality, and Egypt, Egypt as well. And although Genoa maintained free trading rights in Egypt and Syria, it lost some of its territorial possessions after Saladin's campaign in those areas after the defeat of Arsuf. This is kind of uh, normal, meaning imagine you, you are uh, the Ayyubid power, you have uh, Genoese, Venetians, business or trading with your own Egy Egyptian ports, then you conquer the Kingdom of Jerusalem from scratch, for some strategic reasons, you need to occupy stably certain certain cities, their ports, right? Uh, at that point, actually, the uh, the the need you see of the of of the Ayyubid of uh, of the Ayyubids to have a navy would fall 
right? The uh, the Ayubids had a navy on their own to counter the, in fact, the the the, the Italian one, as long as the, the the kingdom of Jerusalem was active, because in order to carry out military operations along the coast, etc., they had necessarily to supply their troops via sea, and as a consequence, you know, if they hadn't had a uh, you know, a navy to counter the, the Italian attacks, they, they would have lost its s s s supply. So, instead, when the Kingdom of Jerusalem what was wiped out, also the necessity to have a fleet vanished, because who cared, right? They had gotten this enormous power, they just occupied some strategic centers, because at that point they, there could be some coming back. So, you know, think about the Third Crusade, um, all the problems, in fact, as we were saying before, with, with uh, Henry, uh, you know, uh, you know, Richard Lionheart, etc. And uh, so some now activity would remain, but still trade with the Italian city-states remained because they needed to make money, right? It was never like, you know, from one side, uh, you know, the Christians were not trading with the Muslims because they were of different religions and vice versa. What? What? Like, you have lost, I think, a a little bit of world history <laughs> in the process, if you think like that. They needed to make money, also because, you know, these wars were extremely costly at the same time. Also, the Genoese intervention in Spain continued. In 1147, the Republic took part in the siege of Almeria in support of Alfonso VII of Leon and Castile to reconquer the city from the Muslims. And after the uh, conquest, uh, the uh, Genoese leased out its third of the city to one of its own citizens, Otto de Bonvillano, who, uh, and this is a good example, we were just uh, saying about the uh, sort of enfeoffment and, and that happened in a, in a private like fashion, swore fealty to the Republic, promising to guard the city with 300 men at all times. So all private resources but still obviously profiting from the city in the I'm simplifying also now the various uh, there are very interesting details about the deals of surrender with the Muslims and you know what they would get in exchange uh, hostages money it really is fascinating and this case also in Spain as you've seen the Genoese got that third like it was pretty standard practice after the conquest and proving the the relevance naturally that the, the, the properly the political leverage that these cities from you know, across sea could could make even you know on an important power like Castilla and Leon and um, uh, the the uh, there are a lot of parallelisms like this the important you see the important was that in the city no family would kind of take over the others but as long as you know they had their own overseas possessions th this naturally could influence the internal political balance but it was mediated that was another land another country they could make their own business as long as they didn't bother excessively in the city also in 1148 Genoa joined the siege of Tortosa and helped Count Raymond Berenguer the, the fort of Barcelona we were talking about him yesterday in video on the crown of Aragon to take the city from which it also received a third. So we can say that between the 11th and the 12th century Genoa became the, if not the, the dominant completely, but you know the first naval force in the western Mediterranean, right? And uh, the, the Pisan rivals were still there, but it would gradually uh, decline in importance, still being however an important competitor. And uh, the Genoese, together with the Venetians, would effectively gain uh, an important position in the uh, Mediterranean slave trade at this time. As we've seen, there was, this was pretty intense. Uh, they, they got slaves mostly from, from North Africa, from, uh, from the Balkans, from, from, from faraway places, because slavery was all around and people... Uh, always fighting each other, always selling their own kin to uh, as slaves to, to other people. And as you know, even, you know, look at the Muslims, they had to properly slave armies, right, or serve armies, say better, but in the, many of the, of the Mamluks were in fact sold by the Italian merchants. And this is important to stress, given we talked a lot about them 
And the Genoese Venetian competition at this point, this gradual expansion of both cities' uh, capacities and ambitions was, was emerging. There were some that did this whole background, the idea of the crusade taking relics right from from the Holy Land was a matter of of pride of in, in the city tradition in the communal identity uh, for example at some point the G Genoese brought f from the Levant what they regarded as the Holy Grail right um, and other and other relics that are still stored in fact in Genoa in their in its many uh, churches historical churches and um, however always bearing in mind that the principal commerce was based about mostly spices right not just uh, you know slavery as well as we've seen but that were the major like all what the, the eastern trade we made a video about this in general you know the, the all what came from the east at this point was effectively monopolized properly in, in the shift from east to west and, and vice versa from the, for the European resources by the Italians there was effectively no other power doing this there were yes other branches of the Silk Road passing you know, through Romania through but the main ones were definitely the Near Eastern also further north but the volume of trade here that developed all those nautical accounting uh, or even m military for the sake of defense uh, capacities was scholarly and surpassable right compared to major rain one and uh, for the rest of Europe and the 13th century was a moment of further consolidation you know this this is the peak of medieval civilization properly of wealth of the idea that by the 13th century especially monetary economy takes off there is an enormous banking development the cities are on the fore also the century begins with a major event as we know the fourth crusade 1204 the French the Venetians essentially conquered the uh, the Byzantine Empire and established thus uh, a Venetian hegemony in uh, the Aegean with ports right this quite strengthened Venetian power uh, and the Genoese had to counter this by, by a certain measure as as we've seen also the, the Byzantine emperors had already previously used the Genoese to counter that Venetian um, you know, uh, the domination of, the, of their markets. Uh, so Genoa allied with Michael VIII Palaiologus, the emperor of Nicaea, who wanted to restore uh, the Byzantine Empire by recapturing Constantinople. And in 1261, the Treaty of Nymphaeum was signed, and it was an alliance between the, the two powers, and uh, on the, on the July, July the 25th of the same year, uh, Constantinople was recaptured, also pretty, you know, pretty randomly telling the truth, with a coup, as the city was left undefended practically by, by the Latins, and therefore reestablished an important uh, control over the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, true, however, Genoese fleets. Uh, so, how did this happen? Also, because the Palaiolic, this was a moment of, of cry, uh, of you know, already of, of difficulty in the area. You know, the, the 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 empire was not as before; it was much more privatized. So, how did the Palaiolic pay for Genoese support? Well, essentially by subcontracting them, the control, actually handing them over the monopolium on certain specific resources in the agency, right? The islands of Chios and Lesbos that were. Pro uh, provided with important uh, resources, primarily alum, that was very important for for tanning. For the same goes for the city of Smyrna, today is Mir. Genoa and Pisa became the only states with trading rights uh, in the Black Sea as a consequence as well, particularly uh, in Crimea, right, where the Genoese colony of Kaffa was established. <coughs> 
there's a lot of stories around that the, those were the Romanized parts of Crimea and the Byzantines had held them. Uh, Kaffa would be uh, today's Theodosia, this th th comes from Theodosia, right? And that also the, the, the place was besieged by the Golden Horde that were allegedly said that, you know, by throwing rotten carcasses of animals, uh, tre trebuchets in the, in the, in the um, Genoese uh, citadel, you know, they, they spread the plague that eventually from there arrived to, to Italy, to southern France, and the Black Death went out, but, you know, that would have spread anyway. But surely, uh, that tells you the dimension also of, of the distance, right? The 13th century is, we made videos about this rec recently, about the great century of the Pax Mongolica that opened all the trade routes. There were, was plenty of, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands of Europeans in China at this point. And all these, uh, the, the main uh, routes of the Silk Road were dominated by these merchants. It was a great intercultural exchange. We're talking about really large scale, uh, extremely dynamic um, relations and that also not dramatically documented as it's mostly the crisis that in generates by the early 14th century that critical uh, almost humanistic in fact modern hist historiographical analysis that allows us in production to say okay what happened why did we grow so much in the previous centuries eventually now things went down well so but we are documented enough about the scale of such trades which is really impressive the alliance with the restored Byzantine Empire also increased the wealth and power of Genoa at the point of, uh, you know, decreasing the Venetian and Pisan one, and this also kind of bringing to to further strains and confrontations with the same. In fact, the the empire had granted the majority of free trading rights in Genoa. In 1282, Pisa thus tried to gain control of the commerce and administration of Corsica. That had, as we've seen, traditionally remained within the Genoese orbit, and exploiting in this specific case the uh, revolt of the judge Sinucello against Genoa in, in the island. Now, in August 1282, part of the Genoese fleet blockaded uh, peasant commerce by essentially shutting the uh, uh, river Arno mouth. And during 1283, both Genoa and Pisa made war preparations on a large scale. Genoa built, in fact, 120 galleys, right? So, again, as we were saying before, find a power that is able to deploy that. Uh, 60 of which belong to the Republic, while um, other 60 galleys were rented to individuals. So this is a pretty good example of how 50-50 the ratio of, you know, publicly held galleys that were surely, you know, being you know, held and produced, right, because the city now was, this was continuous warfare, we're making it extremely simple, but if we go in detail, this was a continuous, continuous military activity at sea for centuries and centuries. So, uh, with state building and uh, gradual centralization of power, you know, there were something like public galleys. Other ones were rented to, you know, privates, they were still Genoese. And more than 15,000 mer uh, mercenaries were hired as Roman and soldiers. Mm -hmm. Also consider that in spite of the myth of, you know, that we are used to, to in our imagery about, you know, the, the Roman of the Galles being whipped and shouted and being all skinny and the nourished, actually being a Roman in the Middle Ages was, was, uh, was a very good job right, it was very well paid, you were very well fed, right, and uh, the Italian maritime republics, and this are some, you know, the, the, they had the best organization in this regard, because of course they cared about their oaring power, these were freemen, freemen, they were not slaves, uh, slavery began uh, in, the, in that sense mostly with the rise of the Ottomans, when there was properly a, you know, more more polarized struggle between the idea of, you know, there is those guys that are normally the enemies, so we can defeat them and use them as orders, they're slaves, and we can also. But technically, you know, if you want your ships to work well, they have to be well manned, right? And Roman also, uh, you know, there are some limits in uh, naval warfare at this point. Uh, 
the galaxies have to stop every uh, every day they have to in fact these people have to eat have to drink uh, you have the, the, and there was a, a great an enormous organization a coastal one that is the same one that would develop so much cartography in these times because they had to know exactly you see the the the, the maps of Europe at this time the the territory the, the continental ones were like all nobody actually made them or if they made them were were not particularly precise but the most precise ones began from the coast so that you get this very accurate almost sa satellite like um, picture of you know coastal line and then the, the continental one really not because there, there was a completely different way to pr and need to practically measure those distances were still mostly like the ancient itinerary it had to how much how how many days of, of of March does it does it take to get there by land right there were completely different points of reference it, by the coast no because this was becoming ever more scientific in nature ever more calculated ever more you know fixed and they had to know consider uh, you know if, if you and I don't know if you ever watched uh, like a map of, of um, those satellite projections of all the various wind uh, currents that exist at certain places and you have to imagine all little circles going different directions that during the year change or you know you know are you know and these people would we have lost kind of knowledge of that uh, uh, let's say of what how they calculated that but people who lived literally at sea traveling all around the Mediterranean the Atlantic etc Atlantic coast I mean uh, the, um, uh, the they would know by heart essentially what was the wind the, uh, the at that time the, of course you can't predict it's not mathematical but but with some degree of percentage of risk right that's also why all these answer uh, banks uh, answering companies etc develop in parallel accounting mathematics right consider the Genoese here were uh, really like other like peasants uh, taking in all these uh, Muslim centers, all the various manuscripts about ancient mathematics, studying them on their own, uh, developing further things that would be wouldn't be changed properly in in the science, in the practice, also of economics, uh, etc. Until the 16th century, right? And I don't know how I got here. Ah, yes, from Mercer and from Roman. Yes, and. Uh, so the sh final showdown um, uh, occurred in 1284. The year before, actually, the the peasants already knew they were kind of the weaker side. They avoided combat. They're trying to wear out the Genoese fleet at sea during the year. But on August the 5th, 1284, the naval battle of the Meloria took place. It's one of the single most important naval battles in in, in in history in general, right? You know, not just in medieval one, for the significance of the predominance of all the, you know, the properly of, of, of the different direction that all a certain um, certain markets would have taken in Europe, in the Mediterranean. When the Genoese fleet, consisting of ninety three ships led by Oberto Doria and Benedetto the First Zaccaria, defeated the peasant fleet, which consisted of 72 ships led by uh, Albertino Morosini and Ugolino della Gerardesca, it's also a, Dan um, you know, a character in Dante's Inferno, if you know it, the story. Genoa captured 30 peasant ships and sank seven, and about 8,000 peasants were killed during the battle, right? More than half of the peasant troops, which were about 14,000. So it's a massive loss. At sea, you really can't do much, right? We we analyzed a bit of naval tactics at this point. It was they were not so different from 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 terrestrial clashes because it was about these packs of ships, like a bit like the heavily armored cavalry in in, in combat. They had to stick together with a very reduced maneuverability because they, they, the important was the mass. Wind could change everything, so everything was literally. Uh, oversimplified to, to, to these greater you know conditions that could interfere in clashing trying flanks attacks let's just like in full you know in, um, land battles and essentially mostly targeting themselves at a distance with with uh, crossbows artillery and and boarding as well 
right mostly trying to you know to knock out properly the of course individual ships breaking the unit and making them surrender and ships can't quite you know just go away away that quickly right they would also hook themselves uh, etc et so that this is the reason why also the, the the gravity of the losses by the way that were however not on, not normal even for for naval standards from the peasant side so this battle is extremely famous uh, the defeat of peace that would bring uh, to its demise as a maritime competitor the Genoese um, the, 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 it required full control of the commer commerce on Corsica not immediately the one you know it wouldn't happen actually the one of Sardinia etc the, the, the was very limited like the range of um, trade activity was by far more important as we've seen the territorial acquisition what these people cared about is that uh, you know they, they were quite mathematical pragmatic mind like you know they had they there, there were a certain amount of ships that would go overseas uh, during the year they had always some losses because of shipwrecks because of enemy attacks etc so what they calculated is just you know what, what do we need to take out to reduce these losses and to go at war with and to defend our vessels with and so on that's it right we don't care about the strip of land because controlling those Syrian or Palestinian uh, or Egyptian ports is by far more important as a constant flow of, of wealth right right so literally from a strategic point of view the terrestrial the territorial gain is, is of limited importance and there are however switches in, in the hegemony here for example the Sardinian town of Sassari which uh, was under peasant control um, as we were saying before the co the, the peasant presence in the coastal Sardinia was very intense right became a commune on its own right so and and this would be patronized by Genoa right and just in certain areas as you understand and by proxy but just again if trade flows as it does that that's good right eventually y just yesterday we were talking about uh, these uh, this scenario when talking about the Aragonese how they conquered Sicily Sardinia Naples etc so these would be the main competitors of the Genoese eventually in uh, in the Iranian, in Western Mediterranean, as we will see, because the Venetians allied with them, and the Genoese were forced to open the the Atlantic routes to actually, you know, uh, to escape that pressure, and that, in a sense, accelerated, like anticipated the age of explorations, opening the route uh, to to go through through the Atlantic, to not by land, like uh, the merchants did, to to Flanders, to to England, etc., and that's. Um, that tells you also how important such consequences could be maybe because of a single bat and uh, after the victory over the peasants the Genoese pressed further south uh, however for for a while to the island of Sicily into Muslim North Africa where the Genoese established other trading posts uh, pursuing mostly the gold that traveled up through the Sahara and establishing Atlantic depots as far as uh, a field as Saleh and Safi in Morocco. There is a great presence of the Genoese on Atlantic Africa at that point as well. And in 1283, the population of the Kingdom of Sicily revolted against the Angevin rule as well. We were saying uh, yesterday with the Sicilian Vespers that so the essentially the Aragonese conquest of the island in an anti-Neapolitan fashion as a result um, Genoa which had actually supported the Aragonese at that up to that point was granted free trading and export rights in the kingdom of Sicily things would change mostly for political internal political reasons and not only as effectively Genoa would become an Angevin ally later on so they became actually enemies of the of the Aragonese and that's also where the uh, the, uh, the, the the enmity would would increase later on with the uh, the, the Aragonese conquest of Sardinia that happened in 1324 from there on yes the that had been a, done at the expense of the peasants that were still there 
but uh, the Genoese were more challenged now and they would always remain, as we've seen, in the north of the island, never kind of pressuring too much, but always being a presence. They were probably a, a lost opportunity, given that uh, Genoese naval power, especially at that range, was, was stronger than the Aragonese one, but they wouldn't press for... Uh, anyhow, Corsica was formally annexed to Genoa in 1347, and in fact would remain pretty late in time, up to essentially the Sun King as a Genoese possession. And uh, in this period, Genoa was accumulating a lot of wealth, uh, as, as it's understandable, but also properly investing in productive activities related to it, especially the, the one that was a bit prevalent in the Italian city states, in the Flemish towns, etc., one of weaving silk textiles, right, for, from imported thread. Um, also, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of uh, imitations at some point, you know, symmetrical styles of Byzantine and Sasanian silks. Uh, also, the Flemish clothes were very pra praised, and we, we made a video and see how the Italians basically not only ma managed to copy them, but also properly to, 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 to surpass the same Flemish ones in, on, on the market which tells you about the enormous productive capacity of these centers and their advancement in properly there were even Flemish that were called to settle in in, in, in the Italian city-states for this specific craft and that's that's important to, to stress even the, properly the connections between these areas of Europe. Now as a result of the economic retrenchment in Europe in the from the mid 14th century we, we, we discussed far and wide at this point, uh, Genoa was mostly engulfed in war with Venice that as started essentially as this war at convoys. First, uh, you know, in the early centuries, the Italian maritime republics m mostly operate sparsely, right? Eventually, you know, the, with the increasing competition between uh, the two and the, the also the, the available, well, the, the things became much more organized. Um, the Venetians especially developed the Muta uh, to, to defend themselves from Genoese piracy. And this gave uh, birth to what we were saying at the beginning of the video about the, this atrociously exceeding but still actually remunerative amount of money invested in war at this point in it properly this changed a bit the world face of Europe because it's been calculated that if I don't know the Venetians or the Genoese had had made the same money but expanding as land powers probably the development of medieval armies would have been consistently different right already at this point you know the, the communal Italy provided a dramatic uh, military organization tactical articulation etc and you know, considering the sheer amount of, of, of of, of, of money invested at sea that was by far exceeding any other country in Europe at this point, we would have had completely different as a completely different political and social development if this had been invested in, in the mainland, right? And Genoa went pretty close to score a victory against Venice. We made a video this winter or spring about properly the Venetian uh, f uh, navy and its organization, we, we dealt a bit with the, you know, sinusoidal trend of, you know, the ups and downs of this uh, ship's, you know, uh, com of this fleet's uh, creation for the sake of emergency, etc. At Chioggia in 1380, after a very promising operation, so the, you know, the destruction of an important part of the Venetian navy and the siege to the St. Venice from the St. Genoa, uh, the Venetians managed with what a, with a astonishingly uh, well-organized amphibious operation to uh, to crush the Genoese army and thus um, ousting Genoa gradually from any chance of dominating the eastern uh, the eastern trade right it was an, ex an incredibly expensive war as we've seen but it was worth it for what was at stake and um, before the War of Chioggia, which lasted from 1379 until 1381, uh, the Genoese had um, received actually also a broader support within northern Italy for their, their action, right? As Venice was importantly mm, heading towards 
uh, some kind of territorial expansion forced by the, the surrounding uh, you know, by surrounding powers at that point to, to defend itself in a preemptive uh, expansion, preemptive strikes. And uh, this victory therefore changed a lot properly in the broader balance of political power. At this point, the, the Ottomans were also on, a, on the scene, right? And this initially started at sea with very, uh, you know, if you want to primitive, disorganized piracy that however was not less pernicious in, in an attritional strategy given that they, they were many right uh, and um, Venice at this point however was mostly in charge with them and they were probably also underestimating them by a certain degree uh, because indeed they had the best navy but again that doesn't mean that politically you're able just to stop another power from, from growing and becoming more threatening uh, according, but we discussed also that scenario. We'll come back on it at some point. In any case, Genoa at this point has shifted towards the west, right? The west, so far west that had passed Gibraltar Strait and gone mostly opening the, the Atlantic route was in its own. Also because the Spanish had at this point mostly Castile had consolidated its control on southern Spain, uh, yeah, at least on the Atlantic watershed with Sevilla, that was an important trade center where in fact the Genoese installed themselves for exporting uh, and so on. In 13, uh, that were now as we were saying before, it's very complex to explain the whole story. So here we just hint at some of the major uh, seigneurial sin dynamics here. Um, Genoa was essentially threatened by Milan at this point because Milan, since the beginning of the 13th century, uh, had effectively threatened from a concrete point of view, properly the annexation of Genoa uh, that had always had some rivalry with Milan since an early time, but that the, the, um, it's, it's that permeability, the terrestrial permeability that Venice wouldn't have, that in the case of Genoa exposed it to, to, to broader uh, international policy on land. And in fact, to protect themselves from uh, the Duke of Orléans and the former Duke of Milan, the Doge of Genoa, Antoniotto Adorno, made Charles VI of France the uh, Defensor del Comune, which means Defender of the Commune of Genoa. These are titles that in the broader seigneurial you know, uh, systematizations would be attributed exceptionally uh, with some continuity, but you know, occasionally, as you understand, given the circumstance. The, Signory means that these guys are become the political protectors of the city. They they receive something in exchange, and they have the chance to to infiltrate fundamentally in this in this case the French and the Italian scenario, and to play their cards accordingly. Uh, and uh, Genoa had already been under partial foreign control before, right? Uh, at this point. It was more consolidated, right? By foreign control, we mean we made a video on uh, foreign intervention in 14th century Italy that can't help to understand what factually this control was. It wasn't much, you know, a, a real capacity to invade these areas, but just a nominal control in these cities, right? And that, of course, would receive support troops and things like these, but it's not quite like. Imagine a uh, colonization of these land. No, it, it was it was unfeasible by the at this point. Right, it, it's not until you know the uh, another century that foreign armies will be able to establish a foothold in the region. And uh, the fifteenth century sees, in fact, an agitation in Genoese policy, exactly because of this increased exposition to major powers, both in Italy and, and abroad. Uh, Genoa, as we've seen, didn't, uh, like, it didn't figure as the main, as a main terrestrial power, right? So even if it was relatively safe uh, in, in its position, it would, you know, as we've seen just besieging, it was a matter, of, you know, it was a, a great logistical enterprise, etc. The political Division within the city would make it permeable, right, to uh, foreign uh, 
uh, domination and generally speaking they wouldn't have aside from the city itself m and, and the fleet properly an army to withstand uh, other power so even if not they had one but uh, they would essentially they wouldn't have much of the strategical initiative at that point so they would just essentially suffer a siege and they're hoping to hold on and that was naturally disruptive for the trade for the income and all this stuff there was a um, naturally a prestige that the city maintained internationally um, as also now a financial center so that you know like at this point we made I uploaded recently the video about Cosimo de Medici and you know we talked about a little bit about Italian banking and how it was in, intertwined with you know uh, European royalty um, uh, in fact money availability and supply and so on and for, for this reason in fact uh, you know for uh, say external powers were, were ever more interested in the city as well there was a brief period of French domination from 1394 to 1409 after which Genoa fell under the rule of the Visconti of Milan and uh, in in the uh, that were the, the major land power in 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 Italy the actually the most advanced military and uh, just very close just across the mountains also in the process general lost its mm, grip on the remaining parts of Sardinia to, to Aragon. Corsica was in revolt, right, and uh, the Ottomans were on the rise in the east. So there is a general gradual decline of its uh, trade flow in practice with strongholds falling in the hands either of the Venetians or the Ottomans, telling the truth. And there's the, all the question of Cyprus. Now, we can't enter now in detail, but it's really a gradual withdrawal, right? At this point, uh, the Genoese have colonies as far as we've seen as the Black Sea, etc., but they are ever less um, impacting in the broader strategical balance. And consequently, also with its the, their capability of controlling the, the trade. In, in the 15th century, two of the earliest banks in the world were founded in Genoa. We're speaking of the Bank of St. George, uh, founded in 1407, uh, to, in order to consolidate the, the commune public debt that had been escalating due to the war with Venice, right, and for trading financial dominance, and uh, which is the oldest state deposit bank in the world, Right, and also its closure at its closure in 1805, the uh, Banca Carriage, uh, founded in 1403, as a mount of piety, which still exists. You know, these were institutions designed to, uh, you know, to 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 give poor people access to loans with reasonable interest rates, and uh, for which the city would. You know, in en masse, you know, derive, you know, um, say, uh, capitalize upon the, this this interest given the, the mass, you know, the benefits, and this naturally with, in parallel with the the, the growth of of the, say, of of the wealth. The, this was a main a way to, uh, for for certain individual families also to have a, you know, a greater impact on the city, the clientele, and so on. But anyhow, and. In this phase, uh, Genoa is is fascinating. Pro probably it's not a very much studied period, but just to say one thing, you know, Christopher Columbus was was born in Genoa, in around the mid fifteenth century, and uh, the donated one tenth of his income from the discovery of the Americans for Spain to the Bank of Saint George in Genoa for the relief of taxation on foods, for example. Um, also, in 1458, Genoa was threatened by Alfonso V of Aragon that had conquered Naples in you know, the previous decade. And for this reason, the, um, Genoa handed the seigniory of the Republic over the French, right, making it fundamentally the duchy of Genoa under the control 
of um, John of Anjou and that would act as a French royal governor right and there would be always factions uh, fighting each other within the city so much that the Milanese uh, one prevailed so that the city revolted and the Republic was uh, restored in 1461 at this point the Milanese themselves changed side so they conquered Genoa in 1464 but they held it as a fief of the French crown considered that the the French also were uh, with the um, you know look in the, were intertwined with the Milanese uh, uh, rulers they, they had some broader interests also claiming back the you know the, 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 the Neapolitan kingdom that the Aragonese had taken from the Angevin so there is an ever greater French interest that uh, eventually is exemplified by the invasion of Charles VIII of Italy and Naples, um, 1494. So that between 1463, 1478, and 1488, 1499, Genoa was held by the Milanese house of that followed the Visconti. From 1499 to 1528, the Republic reached its uh, apex, right, its moment of greatest prosperity, under this almost continual French occupation, right? And um, this tells you how much, you know, the foreign domination wasn't quite like a discriminant for effective decline of the importance of these centers by themselves, right? On the contrary, it was, you know, a way also to enter in the orbit of other uh, powers and you know, according to the situation. The old nobility of Genoa was more traditionally tied to the Spanish influence, uh, of to the, where was speaking to the, also to the uh, castles, right possessions that that uh, Genoa was surrounded by in the region, and uh, they managed in, f in fact to capture the city on May the third, fifteen eighty-two, and they managed even to to mercilessly pillage the city, and the communal. Uh, sense to, to 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 strengthen the uh, the nobiliar rule and the, uh, the the one of the greatest admirals in history Andrea Doria uh, the powerful Genoese plan allied with the Emperor Charles V ousting the French and restoring Genoa's independence um, and renewed prospect open in 1528 they would make in the first loan to the same Charles V German bankers that um, you know there was this practice of subcontracting essentially certain especially mineral resources etc to to compensate uh, them for their loans because uh, the Habsburgs uh, like most of you know monarchies out there were always but especially them like having you know more problems of centralization were chronically short of money right and there after their the the the, the Fugger demise the the Bank of Saint George came to finance not only the Austrian branch but probably the Spanish Empire that at that point Charles had as you know reunified dynastically in his person and and therefore you know going on we would have to talk about early modern Europe and the uh, the Genoese uh, contribution to the Spanish Empire was very very you know, very famous, very important, also many generals of the Thirty Years' War, um, you know, the war, etc. The Dries uh, came from, from the Spinon especially. Um, and, but others too had, this, uh, were, were Genoese, uh, and they, the, the city maintained this centrality um, for, for centuries to come, and, uh, but that's another story. And for today, we stop it here. We'll keep talking about Genoa, uh, some other, some you know, r other aspects of it, m b maybe a bit more in detail about certain phases, its mar uh, maritime capacities, and uh, and also other Italian uh, city states. And uh, for now, however, stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content 
And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.